to Ping Nation. I'm Ken McKim. My guest this week is Sheila Purcell, who is a healthcare advocate and activist in Kentucky. Sheila has been able to successfully make changes in her state at the legislative level when it comes to laws dealing with the prescribing of narcotic pain medication. And I was lucky enough to be able to sit down with her this week via Skype and get her feelings on what the biggest challenges are for those who are chronically ill in that state. Take a look. All right, thank you so much for joining me this week, Sheila. I really appreciate you making the time to do it. Thank you, Ken. Thank so, for being here. Yeah, it's, I mean, I know you're incredibly busy. You're very active in the, the Power of uh, Pain Foundation and, uh, and your efforts there are, are necessary. And so I really, again, I really appreciate you taking the time out to talk with me today. So first of all, uh, I know that you've been very involved in, in activism for the chronically ill in your state. I wanna go back in time a little bit though and kind of describe to me uh, growing up in, uh, in Kentucky and when you were first diagnosed with your first of many, as it turns out, chronic illnesses. In 2001 is when I found out I had Rocky Mountain spotted fever and Lyme disease, which almost killed me. Uh, in 2002 was the first of many heart attacks, and five to be exact, the last one being March of 2012. I've had a total of six strokes, the last one being Christmas Day of last year, uh, two which were full body strokes that I had to come back from, the other one were mini strokes. Uh, and I still suffer from those on a daily basis. Uh, I also have epilepsy, uh, Crohn's disease, uh, breast cancer survivor, and now an ovarian cancer survivor. Okay, so obviously you have a lot of experience with chronic illness throughout uh, your lifetime. And so kind of take me through your thought process. You're, you're dealing with all of this, uh, all of these chronic illnesses. Uh, they're all very painful, obviously. And you're seeking medical treatment here in Kentucky. And at one point, I remember you telling me that you had to uh, leave Kentucky and go to Florida to get the kind of medical treatment that you were looking for. Kind of walk me through what happened in your home state of Kentucky and what led you to, to go to Florida and what happened once you got there. In 2005, I returned back to Florida. Uh, in 2010, I moved back to Kentucky. I was able to secure a doctor here without any issue. Um, Unfortunately, in 2012, there was a family emergency and I had to return to Florida. I was gone approximately nine months. I came back. I waited till three days before all of my medication was to be refilled. I went back to the doctor that I previously had who informed me he could no longer see me. That while I was gone, there was a law passed all called House Bill 1 also known as the pill mill bill in Kentucky, and which doctors were not allowed to write any pain medication. Uh, um, I found that hard to believe, so I started making phone calls to other doctors who refused to see me, 243 to be exact. I then started calling my state representative. I wanted an answer as to why I could not seek treatment in the state, they told me that I was lied to, uh, and at that time, I had just been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I couldn't wait. So I had to return to Florida uh, to receive not just the care that I needed for that, but the ongoing medication to control my seizures, uh, the blood thinners for the stents in my heart, the stents in my brain. Um, it, it was an uphill battle to realize that the state that the state of Kentucky passed a law that literally threw hundreds of thousands of people out without any pain care whatsoever with the 30 day notice from their doctors. And now I'm still going to Florida. Uh, I, that's, I have to. I cannot get any treatment here, none. 
So clearly there were some issues with this uh, state law, this House Bill 1, uh, because it sounds to me like it was greatly uh, restricting the amount of medication that could be prescribed uh, as far as how many days worth you could get. And so if I'm understanding correctly, that's what you set out to, to change. So kind of walk me through that process, how you began your plan of action, how you actually began to, to talk, reach out to your state legislators in order to get them to listen and, and see that this was really something that couldn't continue. The way that I, I got involved in it originally uh, was the law, House Bill 1 was set up where no matter what was wrong with you, if you had any surgery in the state, you were only allowed three days worth of pain medication upon being released from the hospital. My niece had a double lung transplant. I had a group member that was in hospice and it just wasn't working. And that's when I started calling lawmakers and legislators and lo and behold, one of my state representatives, it actually touched his own mother. She had heart surgery, and when they released her from the hospital, they released her with three days worth of pain medication. And he argued with the doctors, and he was one of the biggest supporters of the bill. And he then called me and said, you know, this is what the doctors are telling me. Is this what you are hearing? And I said, it's not what I'm hearing. It's what you signed in a law. This is what you made law. And he didn't believe me. I pulled the law up and I read it to him. And he realized then that there was a flaw within the law, uh, so to speak. Um, we worked hand in hand. My group wrote countless letters and emails and phone calls. We contacted the Kentucky Medical Licensing Board. Any and every representative that voted for this law, I contacted personally, either via hard copy letter, email, phone call. I made sure I contacted each and every one of them to let them know. Now, not only has it affected everyone, it's affecting a state representative. What are you going to do? Uh, um, there was other parts of the law that needed to be addressed, but with the revision made in February of 13, we were able to get the three days worth of pain medication after surgery pushed to 14 days, which is reasonable. Anyone that has surgery should, all upon being released from their hospital, see their doctor within that 14 days. And that I was comfortable with. Okay. so. First of all, congratulations on being able to actually get that changed at a legislative level. I'm not sure you realize how difficult that can be. Uh, I mean, you, you're obviously acquainted with the process, but that's amazing to me that you did that. So congratulations to you and to every member of your group that uh, was active in making that happen. Uh, I also understand, though, that you were still receiving uh, care from a physician outside of Kentucky because you were having trouble finding any doctor uh, within the state that had the knowledge and the desire to treat your, your many conditions and that millions of other uh, residents of Kentucky are facing the same thing. They're facing uh, doctors that are unwilling or just don't have the knowledge to treat them and doctors who are unwilling or just simply afraid to prescribe not only pain medication, but any kind of medication uh, for mental health issues, uh, anything chronic, um, they're just, they're scared to prescribe it. They, they just really wanna be very hands off. And so the people in your state are left with no choice but to go looking elsewhere. The average patient, patient chronically ill patient, in the state of Kentucky, you are, you're correct. Oh, they're, they're seeking treatment elsewhere. To find a doctor here that will be hands-on and be proactive, this is not gonna happen. They're scared, they're, they're terrified. For me alone, uh, again, I said this before, I called 243 doctors. I was able to see one out of the 243 and he would not treat me. 
the way that it is in Kentucky, once you can secure the doctor, they're either pushing injections, they're pushing all the nerve stimulators. So the average person in Kentucky is not receiving care. They're not receiving pain medication. They're not receiving mental health medication for PTSD, anxiety disorders, um, children that need ADD, ADHD. At one time had to present every month to the doctor to be able to get their medication to take a urine test. Um, that was also part that we were able to change. I myself, I'm lucky. My doctor that I had where I lived before, once I called him and said, I cannot secure a doctor here, what do I do? He agreed to take me back. He's able to treat all of my conditions. He's able to send me to the neurologist that I need to see or the oncologist that I need to see. Now, I'm one of the very few lucky that that is receiving treatment. Uh, I'm one of the very few lucky ones that doesn't have to sit day in and day out in pain. Uh, however, just about all of is still leaving and seeking treatment elsewhere. Again, the doctors are scared to death. Uh, they, they don't want to write the medication. They, they're not going to write the medication. I don't care what's wrong with you. They're not going to do it. People are going to Tennessee, they're going to Indiana, they're going to Pennsylvania, they're going to Florida, they're going to, to California, some are going to Colorado. Um, it's a mass exodus, so to speak. I was even told by Morgan Miller, which is the liaison to Governor Steve Bashirs, the governor of Kentucky, that I needed to move back to where I came from. Uh, um, and when I told him that I was going to turn that over to the media, that I recorded it and was legal to record it in the state of Kentucky, he immediately hung up and said, I didn't say that. You can't use that recording. The next time I called the governor's office, Mr. Morgan was, was no longer there. Uh, um, so again, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. The average Patient. This is what they go for. If they're lucky enough to get in to see a pain doctor, their first visit is with the doctor. Then they have to seek psychological counseling to make sure that they're not drug seeking. That's the second visit. The psychological counseling doctor is within the, the confine, so to speak, of the pain management doctor. Both times you have to pay for a urine test, uh, upwards of $500. Uh, once you can pass the psychological testing, then on your third visit, they may uh, give you minimal amount of medication. Uh, um, but again, they, they're pushing these nerve stimulators. They're pushing the Depo, Medrol, Lidocaine shots. Oh, they call them trigger point injections, which are the same injections that killed thousands of people a few years back, if you remember, uh, from a compounding pharmacy. So that, that's the average day in, in a pain patient in the state of Kentucky. Okay, so very quickly then, kind of summarize all the things that were changed in the law as a result of, of you and, and the efforts of your group, your lobbying efforts, and kind of take me through what you think is the next challenge there in Kentucky moving forward for people who do reside there who have chronic illnesses? So far, we have been able, as we've already discussed, uh, to get the three-day law changed for surgeon, or surgery patients, I should say, from the three days to the 14 days. At one time, it was mandatory by House Bill 1 that every month when you went to the pain management doctor or the regular doctor that you had to get a urine test, uh, that has now been changed to once a year if the doctor does not feel as though you are a threat uh, as far as abusing your medication, twice a year if they feel as though it's a possible threat, three times a year 
you know, during one of the previous urine tests or upon speaking with you, they think maybe you're diverting your meds. Uh, however, the doctors are, are not doing that. They're still saying, oh, no, it's law, and this is what, what we have to do. Um, we were also able to get changed, again, the, the children with ADD and ADHD having to be embarrassed uh, and take a urine test in front of a nurse every single month. They don't have to do that anymore. It's the four months out, uh, they, they now have refills on their medication. Um, our next step that, that I would like to take or the, the avenue that I would like my group to go down is when you have your medication filled, if it is a controlled substance, the pharmacies are requiring you to give your social security number. They're saying that it is law. That is not what House Bill 1 states. House Bill 1 states you must have a patient identifier number. That can be anything. It can be your driver's license number. It can be a number that you and the pharmacy come up with together. Uh, it does not have to be your social security number. They're saying it's law. And when you show them the law, they kindly ask you to leave their pharmacy. So my next step that I want to do as far as this piece of legislation is correct that. I, I do not want the, the pharmacies to require your social security number. 80% of all identity theft start in the medical field. So that I, is my next step. That's the, the next part of this law that I want changed. I also want the, the legislators, the lawmakers, to understand that the doctors are still terrified and that they have to lighten up a little bit more, uh, still trying to educate the doctors, uh, and I don't know if it's greed on their part, that I'm not required, and no patient is required to take a urine test to the tune of $500 every single month. Uh, and when you point it out to the doctors, you get what we call here in the state of Kentucky as the green slip. You receive a certified letter that said, there's philosophical differences between you and your doctor, and they're not going to treat you anymore. So it's more working with organizations, doing videos like this, working with my lawmakers, uh, whether it be in the House of Representatives, senators, congressmen, to tweak the law just a little bit more uh, and make it more conducive for, again, not just chronic pain patients, but chronically ill patients across the board, whether it be pain, whether it be PTSD, whether it be anxiety. We are at the back door of Fort Campbell Army Base. This has affected our veterans. It's affecting our children with ADHD and ADD. It's affecting our senior citizens. It's affecting oh, our insurance companies. It's affecting Medicare. It's affecting Medicaid. Now, little granny who's got a bad hip where she was allowed before to go to the doctor every four months isn't allowed to go to the doctor every four months anymore she now has to go every month uh, i don't know about you but i don't want my parents at the age of 80 having to go out in the dead of winter to go see the doctor to receive any form of pain medication because their hip has been replaced or her knee has been replaced or their arthritis is acting up because it's 30 degrees outside. It, it's not fair. So there is still work to be done on this, this law. And, and I'm going to continue to spearhead it and, and work on it and, and do what I can at, at my level to make the, the legislators listen, make the lawmakers listen. Um, there will be a trip made in February back to the state capitol in Frankfurt to talk to them yet again. I'm now working with Barbie Ingalls with the Power of Pain Foundation, and she's teaching me a lot when it comes to advocating. And I could never thank her enough for that. I'm learning so much that now I know exactly how to concentrate my energy, where before I was kind of the lone wolf with 140 people behind her. Uh, um, now I'm not the little anymore. And, and this was all self-taught. I didn't know how to do this. Uh, I just started picking the phone up and made a phone call and realized that you can make a change, but it starts with you. Uh, you can't sit back and complain every day 
and there's so many people, they go to, to chronic pain groups on Facebook or, or other social media, and they complain all day. Oh, my doctor's not treating me right. My doctor will not give me pain medication. My doctor wants to give me this. My doctor wants me to have a stir, you know, nerve stimulator. Um, you know, it, stop complaining. Stop going into these groups and complaining and take that same energy. Write your lawmaker a letter. If you don't know who your lawmaker is, it's easy to find out. Everybody else, Google. Google it. I'll find out who just your state rep re representative is. Find out who your mayor is. Write a letter to your mayor. Write a letter to the editor of your newspaper. Uh, it all starts with one person. And, and to that person. And that each and every single one of us. Until each of us lets every lawmaker and every state know that we're not going to take this anymore. That we are humans that we deserve to be treated as humans. If I allowed my animals to suffer the way I've been made to suffer, I would be sitting in the county jail for three to five years. Uh, something has to change. And the change starts with each and every one of us. And until we do that, stop complaining. Stop going to the different groups and complaining. Write a letter. You don't have to do it. I'll write it for you. Uh, there's form letters. I'll give them to you. Uh, but again, it starts within each and every one of us. Well, it's clear to me that you're extremely passionate about this issue. I happen to agree with you. I think there is a lot of work left to be done. And I think that you are definitely the person to do it. So I want to commend you again for all your efforts. Uh, before we go, if you wouldn't mind telling everyone uh, the name of your group on Facebook and how they can get in contact with you should they wish to have you uh, send them some of those form letters you were talking about uh, to get them jump started on their own advocacy efforts. Sure, the name of the group is United Kentucky Pain Care Action Network. It's on Facebook. Uh, um, it, it's not an open group, it is a closed group at a time, so you will have to ask to join. Or they can simply pick the phone up, give me a call, area code 270-924-0499 after 10 a.m. Central Time uh, and before 7 p.m. Central Time. Perfect. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you again. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I, I, I enjoy working with you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And again, that was Sheila Purcell from Kentucky. And very happy that she was able to be on the show this week. For any of you watching out there, if you have questions, be sure to send them to me, Ken at don'tpunishpain.com. You can also reach me over on Twitter at don'tpunishpain. That's all the time we have for this week, but we'll be back next time. So until then, I'm Ken McKim. You take care. <laughs>